Good afternoon, everybody. You me okay? Yeah, I'll, and I'll slow down, right? I'm aware that I need to slow down when I'm talking. And forgive me if I'm a wee bit croaky. I've got a bit of a, a bit of a cold at the moment. So um, I sat and watched the the the, the Hauntness place this morning, and I was conscious. It was brilliant, but I was conscious that everybody was getting up and, and apologising for, for not being an archaeologist. I also am not an archaeologist. In fact, um, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm not even remotely an anythingologist. I'm a community worker to trade. My background is really in social enterprise. That's my, that's my discipline. But I've worked in my community for about 25 years. Um, and in lots of ways, I think the, the ways that we've been using comics are really about a different type of community work, but one that's fairly traditional. So I thought, to help you understand the projects that we've done, it might be important initially to understand a wee bit about the community that I come from. I'm not going to give you a big pot of history or anything like that. It's Inverclyde, uh, which is about half an hour west of Glasgow. So, you know, the sticks really on the west coast is as uh, as as west as you can go before you hit islands. And it's a post-industrial community. It was a shipbuilding town. There's still one uh, functioning shipyard there. And like lots of post-industrial places, uh, over the last 30 years, pretty much since I've been in school. There's been this constant cycle of regeneration and rejuvenation and all of that sort of stuff. And then amongst that heritage, the sense of what was uh, important to the town, the, the, the shared history of the town, really, I felt, became eroded. And there was this sort of sense that everything kind of started and ended with the shipyards, with the, with the rise of the shipyards and the decline of those in the 70s and 80s. And um, I had family who worked in the yards, you know, as, uh, as, as did everybody in the area, but I really felt that there was something more, there was another story to be told. And so along with a number of other community members, we really set about kind of um, trying to, to understand the stories of the area in a slightly different way. We've done this in lots of different ways. Uh, the, the main graphic you see there is a, is a book that we created, sort of collection of local folk tales. Um, where, you know, if there are any ethnologists in the, in the room, we'd be horrified at our approach, which was essentially just to take a table, set it up in a library or other community venue and just ask people to tell the stories. No cataloguing, uh, nothing at all. We just recorded all of these stories and we published them as books. Um, the one at the top, we, we found a lot of sort of folk motifs and characters that started to recur in these stories. And so we booked billboards around the town and sort of slapped up. Um, you know, the, the highlights of the stories in unusual places, asking people to then sort of follow this website to where they would hear, like, readings of the stories. And down at the bottom, um, that's just horrifying. It's a, a, a sort of a, a reinterpretation of a local folk play, uh, the Galotians play, which is very similar to mumming plays and mystery plays that you get down here, which we were involved in rejuvenating, I believe is the, is the current term, um, uh, a few years back. So lots of different ways we've tackled it. Comics is just the way that we've done it most recently. And uh, I found it to be one of the most successful for a number of different reasons. I think some of that's about the medium itself, and I think some of it's about currently the popularity that exists within comics. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a wee bit about some of our older projects and then kind of a wee bit about the projects that we've worked on this year. And I'm just kind of, because community works my background, I'm quite a reflective practitioner, so I'm going to present my wee bit of warts and all, and then, um, you know, as John says, there's space for you to grill me mercilessly at questions about how badly wrong we got things, um, which we did often. So, uh, the, the fu this, this was one of our earliest attempts at trying to, to get people interested in, in local history that was not traditional history, which was not industrial history. So we collected all these old folk tales of the area, right, and we decided to present them back to the community as a, as a graphic novel, and it's using the fairly well-known, some might say overused trope of the sort of Tales from the Crypt type comic. And what we did there was we got these old folk tales and we then reinterpreted them as those sort of three or four page wee twist in the tale type stories, right? And you'll see at the side there, we've got our hosts, which were important for these comics in the 50s and 60s. These hosts, uh, in this instance, are based on local folk characters. So there's Old Dunrod, who's a, a local warlock, Granny Kempuk, the personification of a local standing stone, and Captain Kidd, uh, a Scottish pirate. Has anybody heard of Captain Kidd? Oh, really? Brilliant. This is like the only audience where you would get a, a yes. Uh, Cap Captain Kidd, uh, a Scottish pirate. Anybody from Dundee in? Good, right. Well, he's from Greenock. Um, Dundee, Dundee seem to have some sort of dubious historical claim to the man, but, but I'm more interested in folklore. So, uh, Captain Kidd, who was born uh, in Greenock, and we used them as the sort of hinges to tell these stories. So this one here, I think, 
the Catman is one of my favourite stories, and I think it symbolises quite nicely what we were trying to do. Um, if you've not heard of the Catman, I would suggest you can Google him later and tumble down a, a rabbit hole of terror into the sort of creepy pasta type alleyways of the internet. The Catman is um, a character I remember from the seventies and eighties growing up, and um, he he lived in a in a cobbled alleyway between. The, uh, the east and the west end of the town, right? So one of those liminal spaces everybody likes. And um, and I remember him because I had to walk to my grand's house. My grand stayed in the east end of the town, which was the more industrial end of the town. So you would walk along the street and halfway along, there was like a big barbed wire fence with some of those concrete tubes behind it. And in there slept the cat man, right? And he would feed all the stray cats in the town. So the place stank, it was really minging. Um, but he slept there and essentially I suppose now I would understand that person as, as someone who was homeless but he had a, uh, already in that period achieved this kind of mythical status he was called the cat man and that's all very well and interesting until about five years ago when some local kids took some photos of the cat man still sleeping uh, in this space still there and there were videos taken of him conversations had with him now is that the same guy that was sleeping 35 years ago when I walked to my grand's in that, in that concrete tube. I don't think so. But it looked the same. And it's an interesting point where is that a true story? Is that somebody who's actually in danger or in need? All of those things all sort of clash together and combine. Um, for my own part, for what it's worth, I'm more interested in the fact that we're still talking about this guy 35, 40 years later. And interestingly, shipyards would employ a cat man. A cat man is somebody that would keep cats on a shipyard to make sure there were no rats on the ship. So the first appearances of this guy coincide with the decline of the shipbuilding industry in the town and unsurprisingly, he turns up at one of those passing places. So we use the cat man as a, as a really important framing sequence to, to retell a lot of these stories. It was very popular and um, you know, what we quite liked about it was that the people then started telling their own versions of the story. Our next project was a wee bit more serious. Um, we we decided it was funded as part of Heritage Lottery's Remembering the First World War um, commemorations. And um, well, commemoration, as you know, can be quite a controversial thing. Lots of people don't agree with the fact that funds such as Heritage Lottery uh, support, uh, you know, commemoration in that way. And while everything that we've done so far had kind of been folk tales and social history, this was something where, where it was, was a historical event. And uh, to be honest, we, we were a wee bit sort of caught in the headlights by that when, when we got the funding, when we were sort of put in the bed, got it, and then we're like, oh no, how do you do this? In a way that's respectful and, and dignified, in a way that doesn't glamorise, but which also doesn't sort of minimise. And um, eventually we settled upon uh, using primary sources. So we went to uh, the, the war diaries, we went to the um, letters home, we, we went to magazines that were published at the time and essentially we told the story of a very small part of the Gallipoli campaign um, which involved a local battalion. And the, the story itself is fairly straightforward, you know, the, the guys uh, turn up on the Friday to take the hill of Achibaba and by the Sunday afternoon they're all dead. You know, it's, it's not a, a, a glorious moment in, in history or anything like that, but what was really important to us, that there was a local dimension, that there was, there was something about the war and the horrors of war that our own area could understand. Um, so, in this instance, for example, this is a poem by the local baronial uh, family, one of the members of that, Sir Patrick Shaw Stewart. It's actually quite a famous poem. Um, it, it's frequently referred to as Stand in the Trench Achilles, and he writes this poem while he's in hospital in Imbrus, sort of recovering between having gone to Gallipoli, been wounded, come back out and is about to go back. And as he's sitting there thinking, oh, it's really rubbish here in Gallipoli, uh, he imagines um, his own death and he imagines it uh, as if it's part of the Iliad. And that's not completely ridiculous because the whole campaign in Gallipoli was being badged as if it were this second Trojan War back home, that the whole country genuinely believed that that's what was happening because it was in the same sort of area and this really heroic uh, stand. So he imagines that, that uh, Achilles comes down to, to help him. Uh, he didn't. And um, the, the thing about this comic in particular um, was that we decided really early on not to shy away from 
graphic, uh, realistic depictions of war and war injury, um, be because this is this is what happened, and um, that had unintended consequences, I suppose, in lots of respects. And as much as we were we were not supported by our local museum and and publicising and, and promoting this book in the way that we had done all our other publications. It was kind of decided that we, we wouldn't be involved in any of the commemorations for this particular group of Argyll and Sutherland uh, Highlanders. The Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders themselves were more than happy to share the, the text and for to come along, but it was it was a wee bit I don't know. I, I think the the context, the immediacy of comics, sometimes the fact that when you're watching something in a film and it's over in a second, whereas an image like that you know, you, you can keep looking at it, you can stay with you. But also I think there was a slight misunderstanding from the, the museum's perspective and as much as it felt like the comics were sort of not the medium for it, it was almost like it was belittling the story, um, which I'm sure my colleagues might have come up against as well in terms of how comics are understood as a genre and whatever else. Interestingly, the violence, the, the, the truth um, have made it quite... Um, well used within Scottish secondary schools where it's found a life outside our own community where it's, it's been used and I've, I've went to, to speak to a number of schools across Scotland about, um, about this particular part of the campaign. The next one uh, that I'm going to tell you about is much more recent, a bit more straightforward. Uh, so this I suppose is the point where as, a, as an organisation we had done lots of different community heritage projects, lots of different things, we hadn't done anything that was archaeological and um, that's Simply because, as I say, mostly what we had been kind of looking at is, is folklore and folk tradition and whatever else. But in 2017, it was the year of history, heritage and archaeology in Scotland. And there was resource made available for lots of community projects to explore and make uh, available local archaeology. And there was an organisation, and there may have been an equivalent in here, called Scotland's Urban Past. Has anybody heard of those? No? essentially a group of community-based archaeologists who were able to come out and work with community organisations and schools. So we, we over uh, a year, in 2016, 2017, we did a couple of different projects with them. Um, this one uh, was based on an old cycle track, uh, or sorry, an old uh, railway line, which had been turned into a cycle track. And originally the railway line had crisscrossed all the industrial areas of the town that were no longer there, but it was now this sort of, it was now this cycle track behind the primary school. So we got a very bouncy group of P4s and 5s along with uh, these community archaeologists. We got them to survey the site, you know, they went, it was mayhem, trying to, it was like herding cats the whole time, but they did, you know, they measured up buildings, they, they looked at the spaces round about them and the places, and the whole point of the Scotland's Urban Past project and ours was less about the physical archaeology of a place and much more about the, the, the sort of active imagination between, right, okay, this is this really built up derelict urban environment that you're in now, but it was this amazing thing, it was this amazing place, this, this stuff happened. So uh, using the, the sort of the, the more urban uh, area as the jumping off point, they, we created a framework where it was this ghost train clickety-clacking along these tracks and visiting all these old industrial sites in the, in the town. And the kids helped us create the stories for that. And that's kind of how we work. We provide a framework and then um, classes, community groups, whoever it is that we're working with, we'll guide them to sort of put the story together, but the story is the communities. You know, we're not really there to write it for them. We're there to facilitate the story happening, um, which means you get some very unusual things happening in those stories, but you just have to go with it. For example, the, the derelict factory you see on the top left there um, is, is, uh, is Playtex, it was Playtex factory. Playtex were a huge employer in our area before they, uh, they went bust. Um, well, that particular factory went bust. Uh, and so the children were really insistent that there were a number of haunted bras should should sort of be in the be in the comic. We we did manage to find a sort of a, a middle ground there that there wasn't there wasn't haunted bras, but you know, good idea, imaginative, I suppose. Our next project was much more traditionally uh, archaeology, which was um, a, a vitrified hill fort in Port Glasgow, which had been excavated in the nineteen sixties, like three trenches, really really very basic stuff and they'd found some Roman stuff, and they'd found some Iron Age stuff, but not very much, not enough for anybody to come back. But again, we quite liked the idea that, wow, look, there was like this hill fort just behind your school, isn't that amazing? And um, so we went up, our idea was to go there, and so we're going to take the kids out, and we're going to visit, and we're going to do some actual surveying work, 
totally impenetrable, surrounded by trees, you know, up up to your eyes in grass trying to walk through it. But again, what we what we liked was this notion that we could take uh, some of what had been at that site and use that as the jumping off point. And so here um, we got uh, objects from the, some of the finds which were brought along and we used those really as the jumping off points for the creative outputs. Some of that was music, uh, some of that was poetry, but the, the largest part of what, what we worked on was, was again comics. And again, a slightly... Um, that's just in there because I really like that photo. It's not in a comic or anything like that. They just, they just had such fun sort of imagining the, how the space would be. The main, um, the main issue with using the objects, which we hadn't really thought about, was that the objects are experienced now. So in a class of first or second years who haven't maybe, and this is a, a you know, I should maybe have been clear, the schools that we're working with, we were actively working with young people who were more generally disengaged from regular curriculum, uh, who weren't, um, active learners or whatever else and um, you know, in many cases hadn't seen any uh, museum stuff before so it was great the museums were able to come down and help us with the objects but you experience those objects tangibly in the moment that you're in and it was difficult for some of them to you know perceive how they might have been previously right no matter how it was it was expressed or explained and so what we ended up with in these stories and comics um, was an awful lot of M.R. James style stories where people stole objects and then were haunted by guardian spirits or, or that kind of thing. I mean, we released it just before Christmas last year, so it actually worked out really well in the, in the long run. But yeah, there was lots of, you know, this is a wax tablet in that one that's been stolen and then sort of ghostly letters start being written on it. But what was amazing is that it was the young people in these classes that were writing these stories. You know, we didn't, we didn't turn up and make them watch or whistle and I'll come to you or anything like that. They, they themselves arrived at these sorts of stories. This one that I really liked, um, this was quite different. So um, they turned the story of another archaeological dig on the Clyde in the, in the 60s, um, which was excavating a Cranog site, or a supposed Cranog site. In fact, it turned out not to be. Um, but uh, so here, so if you're not aware, Clutha is, is the Gaelic for for Clyde. And so this this is about uh, you know, the archaeologist, you'll see her there, Fiona, uh, uncovering this mysterious ancient object which then turns her into Clutha, the goddess of the Clyde and it is a panel for panel rework of Thor's first appearance in, in, uh, in Marvel Comics but I quite liked how that was that was turned around by the young woman who wrote this particular comic um, uh, so much so that definitely we're, we're doing a spin-off comic with Clutha and other things so, so um, this project uh, we, we, uh, we did just at the start of this year, we're kind of halfway through it. So we were asked um, to come and work with a group of Syrian families who had recently arrived in the area. The children uh, were integrating into schools, but the adults not so much yet. So it was an integration, it was one part of an integration project, right? And we were asked essentially to come and speak about um, the folk tales of the area, that kind of thing, you know, as a, as a way of helping them understand the more interesting aspects of the community as opposed to maybe the bits they've experienced so far, which was exactly why we had done uh, those kind of folk tales anyway. And, um, and then to help them create a story or a comic themselves about their experiences since coming to live here. There's a really rich tradition uh, in, um, in comics of, uh, of telling those stories of journey, um, refugee uh, stories particularly over the last couple of years ours was a, was a very sort of different thing essentially the idea was to was to sort of clash those those two cultures together a wee bit um, and so we spent a lot of time just having fun making those comics and it was quite tempting often um, over the first couple of nights you, you, you know boys tended to do stories about gigantic robots uh, destroying hospitals girls tended to do stories about um, fairies or unicorns taking them away to the moon where it was safe and it was really easy to assume that that was for a particular reason. That's my own biases, obviously, coming across there. These are just straightforward stories that you would get from anybody. Um, but ultimately, what they created was a, was a lovely wee comic, some of which are over there and you can take away with you. And um, I think what I liked most about this was that ultimately, um, you'll see that we, we, we used, because the parents of the, the children still were not speaking English, um, but the kids wanted them to read the comic. We used HP Reveal, which is pretty straightforward. I don't know a lot of archaeology uses it and whatever else. 
um, so that every time you you know you put your phone over the panel, you you get the comic was read in Arabic, uh, and a number of images of the kids sort of actually putting the comic together. Dead simple wee thing to do, but just nice in terms of uh, accessibility. So um, um, yeah, okay. I'll tell you one more then, one more just before I before I finish up. This was the um, a project we did just at the start of this year, which was a lot of your comics that you'll see have been about working with children and younger people, but comic fans and comic readers and uh, comic writers aren't all under 18, so I thought it would be quite interesting to, to go and speak to a group of older people in, um, in Scotland and, and the rest of the UK, but in Scotland particularly over the last year there's been a lot of um, interest in preventative measures, uh, preventative health um, measures around social isolation to combat the, our loneliness epidemic, and so essentially we got a group of older people together and got them to, to create comics. Again, the same process as everywhere else, and what you got out of them was, you know, that yeah, some of those were reminiscences, some of them were kind of misty style comics about time slips and all that kind of thing, or, or really romantic dramas, or, or even just silly stories about the first time they went for a job, but a really rich seam of stories. What I like most about this project, other than the, the comic itself, again, there's some copies over there for you to grab, was that the group, a, a good number of the groups stayed together uh, and kept writing. Not comics, maybe so much, but they kept writing stories and whatever it was, and that, Ultimately, it was was um, was the aim. So there's there's lots of other projects that we've, um, we've we've sort of tackled over the time, but I don't want to too much over my over my time. I'll just finish off, uh, I suppose, maybe with this one, which again I think symbolises quite nicely that there's there's absolutely nothing that can't be tackled. A local housing association came to us and asked if we could tell the story of their housing association's fifty years, and on the face of it, you think, wow, that's that's a tough gig. That's really <laughs> how how much fun can we make that? But it it was fun. It just as much as anything else. Because inside all of those places and buildings and whatever else, there's people, and those people have got stories. You just got to dig a wee bit. And uh, I think that's what I've enjoyed doing the most is is digging for those stories. Um, so thank you very much.